I have the pleasure of introducing the last two speakers of the day. It's my great pleasure to firstly introduce Richard Halliwell. So Richard is an anaesthetist over at um, Westmead and he's previously been a member of the ANZ HFR um, steering group. Richard is somebody who has, has and continues to be very proactive in providing support, advice and management um, in the care of the hip fracture patient and also providing very sage counsel. So Richard, welcome. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Okay, so thank you very much for asking me to uh, present today. Um, so I work at Westmead Hospital. We have a large hip fracture service, which um, it's a real burden of care. So this is a topic which is very close to my heart. So I just want to background the clinical problem of pain relief uh, in hip fracture patients. Obviously they're elderly, but they come with all the problems of the elderly patient. They're very frail, they have all the diseases of the elderly, which relates to uh, hampering their post-op recovery, uh, morbidity and mortality. And uh, as Jackie pointed out earlier, very high risk of delirium. And delirium is, is something that should not just be looked at in isolation, but it's important uh, short and long-term serious consequences. And in this group, they have a diminished tolerance of conventional analgesics, particularly opioids. So where do we come from? In 2014, Jackie and Ian chaired the ANZ hip fracture uh, guideline care, and uh, that had some important statements to standardise uh, management of pain after hip fractures. So in the analgesia section, the main thing it said is ensure analgesia is sufficient to allow movement necessary for investigation and for nursing care and rehabilitation. Um, said also consider adding nerve blocks if systemic analgesia does not provide sufficient pain relief. So that was just saying consider. And coupled with that about systemic uh, analgesics, it said caution is advised when considering non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in as an older population, which intuitively seems a good safe thing to say. Um, this was, this guideline here was closely adapted from the NICE guidelines from the UK, which came out in 2011, which very similar, except the last comment down the bottom said non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are not recommended. So that was a very, a more stronger note of caution. Um, other guidelines that have come out since then, there's the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, an evidence-based guideline, and they said quite strongly, perioperative regional analgesia, there's strong evidence to support that improves pain relief in patients with hip fracture. So that's the only thing that I've come across which is more recent, offering a much stronger uh, statement for regional analgesia. So the most common technique we've talked about with regional analgesia in this group of patients is the fascia iliaca block. And this is just a diagram, a cross section uh, at the upper thigh showing the, the femoral muscles, particularly the iliacus muscle, and above the iliacus muscle, there's the fascia iliaca. So the, the aim is to deposit local anaesthetic under ultrasound control into this space proximal to the ingual ligament. So it blocks the femoral nerve, the, the um, obturator nerve, and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. So it's more useful than a femoral nerve and a block, and it's also probably safer. And it's something that can be used um, quite, quite well by non-medical staff. So here at Westmead, we have some CNCs in the emergency department, which will do these blocks. And I think that's an important part of improving uh, the availability of these blocks in patients in hospital. The other talking point is uh, single shot versus continuous catheter techniques. And I saw there was a, uh, a comment in Slido talking about this. So what we'll do, we'll do a single shot technique if the patient's expected to go to, to theatre either that day or early the next day. But if the timing of theatre is, is beyond 12 to 24 hours, we'll put in a catheter and run a continuous infusion through a pump uh, using a, a programmed intermittent, intermittent bolus technique. <clears throat> 
So this is just the ultrasound review, uh, view of that uh, diagram before. So this is what you see on, on ultrasound. So there's the sartorius muscle, the iliopsoas, and there's the fascia iliaca. So the idea is to pop through the fascia iliaca and deposit uh, local anaesthetic in that area to block those three nerves. Um, a very useful guideline and training package has been put out by the New South Wales Agency for Clinical Innovation. So if people want to find out some more information, I'd uh, strongly recommend having a look at this. So it, it goes to the training requirements. So that's a knowledge of the anatomy, the ultrasound, um, the pharmacology, and also a, tra uh, a log of use of uh, performing the blocks. So people can uh, have a log to show how many they've done. So that's a really good structured package. So what is the evidence for using a fascia iliaca compartment block? So we saw in our ANZ guideline that to consider regional analgesia, this is a systematic review published in 2018 in the British Journal of Anesthesia. And what it found is that compared with uh, opioids, there was less pain on movement by using a fascia iliaca compartment block. Uh, it reduced pre-op opioid requirements, which is beneficial because we're concerned about the adverse effects of opioids in this group of patients. Uh, it increases the time to first request for analgesia and has some other benefits like shorter time to perform spinal. And very interestingly, there was less delirium in the group that had a fascia iliaca block, so a relative risk of 0.45. But that, that comment is tempered that only two studies were able to demonstrate that. But I think anything we can do to minimise uh, systemic uh, opioids and improve pain relief on movement is certainly beneficial. Uh, especially as we know about the, the serious adverse consequences of delirium. Um, now, we've got evidence that fascia iliaca compartment block is good, but um, I think it's only used commonly in places where there's strong motivation. And this great quote by the management guru, Peter Drucker, says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So even if we all agree that it's a great thing to do, it's still not going to happen. So really, the success that we've had in making it happen here, we've got a really a block service, which is an extension of our acute pain service. We've got uh, a group of staff that are highly enthusiastic and skilled in ultrasound use. So we can provide this seven days a week to patients, but uh, it really requires a strong commitment from the institution to provide that service. Um, a little bit about systemic analgesics. So we've talked about certainly uh, good evidence for benefit of fascia iliaca compartment block, but patients will still get opioids and possibly uh, non-steroidals, which is non-selective non-steroidals, things such as ibuprofen, et cetera, or coxib such as celecoxib. So what do we know about choosing those? Um, certainly in opioids, uh, we've very concerned about opioid use in the fractured neck of femur group. There's uh, de delirium, respiratory depression, associated hypoxia and risk of falls. There's other systemic effects such as uh, on the GI system, constipation and nausea and vomiting, which impacts on their recovery. And there's a, a significant degree of caution about the um, indiscriminate use of long-acting opioids such as Oxycontin and Targin in this group. Um, the benefits of uh, non-sterols and coxibs can be summarised here. There's reduced opioid dose requirements, so you can reduce your opioid dose by about a third, and also the associated opioid adverse effects, such as respiratory depression and nausea and vomiting. Um, certainly, the standard uh, non-steroidals, such as ibuprofen, are sold in supermarkets, and we know they're very commonly used in the elderly population. Uh, they don't have to go to a pharmacy, they can just buy it when they're getting their bread and milk at the supermarket. Um, this concern about potential increased risk, uh, certainly renal impairment. Um, so that stands for both the traditional non steroidals and the coccyx uh, as well. Um, cardiovascular risk is potentially increased with the coccyx because of a, a prothrombotic effect. Uh, coccyx don't interfere with platelet aggregation. So there's been some concern about uh, increased myocardial infarction and stroke with use of those agents. Um, what we don't know is whether what the safety 
risk benefit is in short term use, say for a few days after surgery, in patients who are otherwise low risk that uh, say particularly have normal renal function. Um, this is an interesting um, large cohort study published in Archives of Internal Medicine. Um, it was uh, a group of elderly uh, community patients, mean age of 80. Um, they were, had, hadn't been on non or coxes or opioids. And what this study did, it, uh, it's a prospect, it was a cohort study that used uh, propensity uh, scoring to adjust for risk. And it found some important uh, bits of information which we should take on board about when using opioids in elderly patients. So opioids increased all-cause mortality, which has a risk of 1.87. That's in comparison with coxibs or uh, traditional non -steroidals. A safety event needing hospitalization was increased, it has a ratio of 1.68. And a risk of fracture from falls was greatly increased with a hazard ratio of 4.47. So it certainly says in the, in the community, use of opioids is, has significant risk. Um, but as I said, mentioned before, there's uncertainty about the safety in short-term use in the, the perioperative period. Um, the I just want to touch on the choice of anesthesia. Some of the, the questions in um, Slido and particularly what Jackie talked about, the importance of delirium, uh, relates to the choice of anesthesia. Um, there's been decades of debate about whether GA uh, versus spinal, the jury's still out. The problem is post-op delirium is very common after hip fracture surgery, it's about 24%. So the question is for anaesthetists, what can they do to reduce that very high rate of post-op delirium? Um, there's been a lot of interest over the last few years about directly monitoring the brain. So this is one type of uh, processed EEG monitor. So you can titrate the anaesthetic dose to an appropriate level of anaesthesia. So the anaesthesia is in a therapeutic range, not too high, not too deep. And what we do know in elderly patients, typically as a group, they don't need much general anaesthesia. So intuitively, giving them too much general anaesthesia uh, without direct monitoring the brain may be hazardous. So we do have a Cochrane review here done in 2018. And one of the things they looked at, there's a forest plot here showing using uh, processed EEG for guidance of depth of general anesthesia versus the usual clinical signs, um, found a difference in the incidence of delirium. So in the group that had a type of processed EEG to guide anesthesia, the relative risk of delirium was decreased by 0.7. So that's something which tends to indicate that it's, if someone's going to have a general anesthetic, then delirium is reduced if you uh, use processed EEG for guidance of your depth of anesthesia. Um, so I just want to finish off the ANZ uh, guidelines were published seven years ago. And over that time, the community is getting older and there's a growing burden of care that we all see in hospitals of treatment of hip fractures. And we now have new evidence to refine the, the guides about use of regional analgesia. So we've got a system, systematic review which shows that regional analgesia improves pain with, with movement. Uh, we've got some large uh, cohort studies which show that systemic analgesics, uh, particularly uh, coxibs and non steroidals may be preferable uh, compared with just using opioids and probably should be a bit more um, circumspect about uh, not using non steroidals or coxibs in this, in this patient group. And then finally, if we're going to use general anesthesia, there is some evidence now to show that tailoring the depth of general anesthesia significantly reduces uh, post-operative delirium, along with all the serious consequences of that. So, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Richard. That was, that was great, uh, particularly that last slide on the depth of anesthesia. When's that paper coming out, do you think? Uh, I'm not sure. It was only presented at the Australian New Zealand uh, scientific meeting on Friday. Um, so yeah, if I, if I find, I guess, look out for it, it'll be the, the balanced delirium sub-study. Okay. So hold off the press, everyone. Um, we'll look out for it when it is published. We'll also um, put it on our, use our Twitter account to, to circulate it to people who are following us. Richard, there's a number of questions. I'm aware we're a little bit behind time, but we yep. will catch up because I will not take 15 minutes at the end to close. So here okay. are some of them. 
What are your recommendations for PRN analgesia in patients that you think are high risk of developing delirium? What, what are your choices and why? Um, I think as a background, if someone's at risk of delirium, I think it's intuitively worthwhile to minimise use of opioids. So I think certainly regular paracetamol, and if the patient's considered low risk, consider a, a suitable appropriate dose of a non steroidal of a coxid. So those together will minimise your opioid requirements. Um, for PRN, I think just a safe dose of, uh, say, oxycodone um, is the way to go, or subcutaneous morphine if the patient has normal renal function. Okay, lovely, thanks. Um, should people be offered a routine um, fascia upper block um, if their fracture pre presentation is after hours? I think if you can do it, that's great. Right. Otherwise, first thing in the morning, the, the, you know, if what we do, the after hours is very difficult with limited staffing, but it's flat. The request is flagged with our after hours registrar and passed on to the acute pain team in the morning. So we go and we go and do it. If the patient's um, going to theatre straight away, we wouldn't do it. But if it's later that day, we certainly do it. Um, and if the patient's going to theatre that the following day, we do a block with a catheter. I think the culture in ED is also changing over time now. Um, yes. For us, for us years ago, we would have never got a block at night time. It's routine now. So I think there's lots of good things happening in that space. Uh, another question, it might not be an easy one to answer. Is there much research into what anesthetic agents are more likely to cause post-operative delirium? Uh, I don't think specifically, you know, one agent versus another, but I think the ultimate effect, I think, uh, that last slide about monitoring the brain and uh, you know, titrating the depth to an appropriate life light but still effective general anaesthetic is the, the way to go. I, I don't think there's any evidence to say use one versus another. Okay, well, one more question. And then the rest of the questions that are not answered, um, we'll, we'll give some thought as to how we can get back to everybody with answers to those questions. Uh, Richard, intravenous non-steroidals intraoperatively. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, the only one that's, that, well, there's two, two that are available. There's paracoxib, which is basically intravenous celecoxib, very long acting, up to 24 hours. Uh, the usual adult dose is 40 milligrams, but I think a reduced dose of 20 milligrams could be used, as long as there's not a contraindication, you know, if the patient's got known significant coronary artery disease or renal impairment. Great. Okay, that's really helpful information. Um, I doubt many people are using intravenous non-steroidals, but as Richard has highlighted, there is some evidence to support it. So something to think about. Richard, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.